In the last episode of Beating the Machine, we needed the mindset and logic of a computer hacker to draw our conclusions. So for this episode of BTM, we're going to need a completely new box of tools. Ladies and gentlemen, put down your connection pods and ID cards because we're now going to take a look at every single game in the Submachine main series, and you're going to need the following. A literature textbook and a Bible. Yeah, that's right, you heard that correctly. A literature textbook and a Bible. Oh, and you also have to know how to count to ten. Let's get started. Some of you are already thinking, why did I ask you to metaphorically pick up these two things? And I know there's a person or two out there who's already guessing what this video is going to be about. And you guessed it correctly, today's theory is all about how the lore of the entire Submachine main series is actually a parallel story to the events described in the Holy Bible. It was right there in our faces all along. Now we just need to dig out the complete explanation. Okay, I was joking. That would be utterly ridiculous. As far as I know, the Submachine series has no direct connections to any events referenced in the Holy Bible. If there's someone out there who feels motivated to come up with a theory video connecting the two, go for it. I wish you the best of luck. Today's video instead discusses a literary technique of all things that is used more often than is realized, and I had you bring your Bible along because the literary technique is implemented in the Bible several times during key events. This technique also has helped shape each of the Submachine main series games over the course of a decade and again, it has been used more often than realized. The technique in question is known as a chiastic structure. A chiastic structure is a sort of framework applied to different parts of a written work where parts of text, main themes, or key events are mirrored or alluded to later in the work found in reverse order. The Holy Bible contains a few great examples of this, and the one that grabbed my attention the most is the chiastic structure in the account of Noah and the Flood. For those of you who don't know the full story of Noah and the Flood, basically the Christian God became angry with how people were treating everything and everyone and sent a flood across the entire earth to wipe out all but two of every species on the planet, saving a man named Noah and his immediate family. Then the flood receded and the earth was reborn in a sense. The major events and passages of this account are shown here, condensed with summarizing words that capture the basic idea of every few verses. And as you can see, these verses are in chronological order, for the most part, and a specific sequence of themes is followed. And halfway through the story, the same themes can be seen, but they are now in reverse order. One critical event in the middle serves as the boundary, between the two sides of the story. It's almost as if somebody took a mirror and simply flipped the one side of the story over so that it appeared on the latter half, and everything lines up perfectly. This is the essence of a chiastic structure, to tell a story in such a way that you could fold the story in half and each part in the first half would line up with a part in the second half. Sometimes the parts that line up are the exact same, and other times they have the same idea but are polar opposites of that idea. It's a literary version of looking into a mirror. Elements such as these that are found in a chiastic structure are often categorized in an ascending slash descending form like A, B, B, A, where each letter represents one pair of similar elements, and if there are three different elements, then the pattern is A, B, C, C, B, A, and so on. The explanation of Noah and the Flood has ten elements on a side, along with an extra unpaired and super important verse in the middle, which serves as a boundary. If there's a middle turning point in a piece of text progression, it's often denoted with the letter X. So the story of Noah would have a chiastic structure of A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, X, J, I, H, G, F, E, D, C, B, A. Thankfully, the chiastic structure found in Submachine isn't nearly as complex as there are only 10 main games to compare to each other. 10 divided by 2 is 5, so there are 5 pairs of games that directly compare or contrast with each other, and this gives us a chiastic structure with the form A, B, C, D, E, X, E, D, C, B, A, with the X being the transition between subs 5 and 6. We'll match the games up as follows. 1 with 10, 2 with 9, 3 with 8, 4 with 7, and 5 with 6. Now all we have to do is compare each game in a pair with the other and see the characteristics that show how much these games reflect each other either in their obvious similarities or their stark, undisputable differences. At this point you might have started to notice that this video is not really going to be describing a theory as to why things happen in the series. No, this video is more of an exploration of a flawlessly integrated idea that the developer Matthew Skutnik chose to include in his games. But either way, it's time to let loose a rapid fire sequence of compare and contrast lists of characteristics that I took a solid hour to compile in my head. Keep in mind that everything I'm about to talk about applies to the main series only. Anyway, it's time to let it all out.
Submachine 1 the basement versus Submachine 10 the exit. First immediate characteristic apparent in these two games is the game's size, calculated by the number of screens. Sub 1 is easily the smallest game in the main series with 23 screens, and the first version was even smaller with only 11 screens. Sub 10 meanwhile sports a staggering 473 screens, making it the largest game in the main series and the second largest in the complete collection of Submachine games, only falling short to Submachine Universe, which currently contains 704 screens. Besides game Game sized games also contrast in story development. In Sub 1, we only get to see one note that starts the entire lore of the series, and it's a note that hardly makes any sense for someone who hasn't played the rest of the games. Sub 10 concludes that lore, nine games later, in a series of answers with more questions sprinkled in as well. It's the end of a classic story, the exposition and opening of the story in the beginning, and the closure in the finale. Thirdly, the devices and objects seen in the two games can easily be the most contrasting in the whole series. In Sub 10, we roam about the locations via car karma portals, light spheres, binary portals, and several ornate doors and karma portal stands. And in sub 1, only one basic formula need apply, and that's good old doorways and ladders everywhere you turn. So sub 1 and sub 10 contrast in a couple of ways, but there are a couple things that they share in common. For example, they're the only games with a clear escape sequence at the end. And yes, the one at the end of sub 1 is completely fake, but at least the classic you have escaped goal of room escape games has been achieved, at least until Submachine 2 happens. None of the other games in the series end with this clear-cut idea that the player has escaped from somewhere. The player only leaves with the feeling of going somewhere else still in the subnet. The two questionable exceptions are the endings of Submachine 2 and 3, but the doubts of escaping are easily instilled in the player's mind during the end sequences. And in this sense, subs 1 and 10 are truly special. Sub 1 and sub 10 also contain one famous puzzle, the Tile Puzzle. While the Tile Puzzle is also seen in Submachines 4 and 9, those two games don't attach the same critical importance to their completion like subs 1 and 10 do. And in the case of sub 1 and sub 10, both times the Tile Puzzle is used to access the Lighthouse. Sub 1's Tile Puzzle lands us in a straight shot through the infernal basement and then the basement exit to get to the lighthouse dungeon via a concealed karma portal, and subs 10 multicolored tile puzzle grants us access to the metal section where we travel by karma portal again to land in the lighthouse tower. But even though the two tile puzzles require the same four tiles, the way we go about getting those tiles also differs greatly. Sub 1 has us solve four different mini puzzles to complete the main puzzle, while sub 10 contains an entire puzzle network that builds up to retrieving the karma portal stabilizer, which is then used to access access all four tiles at once. The exact same, yet polar opposites at the same time. How crazy is that? Just a little deeper thinking reveals all of these hidden connections that aren't easily seen on first glance. Now it's time to move on to the next pair of games. Submachine 2 The Lighthouse versus Submachine 9 The Temple. The first characteristic I would like to point out is perhaps more than a bit subjective, as it is based on the community opinions of the music soundtracks for these two games. But I feel it's worth mentioning since the Submachine community has been so involved in this series, and their input is more than welcome. Submachine 2 is consistently thought of as having the most disturbing, claustrophobic, and eerie soundtrack in the whole series, while Sub 9, on the other hand, is consistently thought of as having the most lighthearted, upbeat, and airy, and ethereal soundtrack of the whole series. This characteristic of music is of course not an accurate comparison or contrast between the games, but it does set the stage well for the general feelings that the player has in these two games, and their direct contrasts of each other. We're dropped into Sub 2 with literally no idea what we're doing or what we should be doing, and in Sub 9 everything starts to come together and we start to feel more enlightened about what's actually going on. In Sub 2, it's the first game where we really feel the impact of the strange and mysterious place that we're in. We start finding all of these notes about Murtaugh's experiments and the gaining of his powers, as well as his interactions with Liz. It's a ton of information that doesn't really make sense at first. By Submachine 9, though, the information begins to be pieced together. And notice, too, that in Submachine 9, most of the notes involve Murtaugh's direct connections with Liz or the origins of where he got his karma power, just like in Submachine 2. The sense of duality between the characters only gets stronger and stronger. However, there are differences to be noticed here as well. The first is that in Submachine 2, all of the notes found are either written directly by Murtaugh or Liz. But in Sub 9, all the inscriptions on those fancy pedestals are written by neither Murtaugh nor Liz, but instead by at least one and sometimes two unidentified speakers. Does anyone have any theories for who those two speakers are? Because I sure don't. The next characteristic that I would like to discuss about these two games is the physical structures in which they reside. Sub 2 contains three main areas, the starting location of the lighthouse dungeon, the maze-like sewers, and finally the lighthouse itself which provides the game's title. Inversely, Sub 9 also has three main areas, the starting location of the 
the garden, the pyramid which contains many puzzles which we have to backtrack a good deal for, and finally the temple itself which provides this game's title as well. Notice also that the lighthouse was built directly on top of the route, and the temple and pyramid also seem to have been sandwiched together as well. Is that a coincidence? I think not. Not only does the location on top of location similarity shine through, but the general direction of the player's movement is also mirrored in these two games, as well as being particularly unique to the entire series. All of the other games in the series feature maps of locations that are primarily horizontal in structure, pushing the player left and right. However, in Submachine 2, the player's progress steadily pushes straight upward as the player climbs the lighthouse and its tall tower, and in Submachine 9, the progress is pushed downward as the player passes through the temple and the pyramid looking for answers, finally ending up at the base of the towering statue of Shiva. You think that applying the phrase getting to the bottom of all this might be too literal in this scenario? In any case, the games show clear opposite directions of vertical movement, which is a trait that only they share out of all the games in the series. Also notice that both game areas are for the most part all conglomerated into one huge map, rather than jumping from isolated location to location, or sublocation to sublocation. Even in Sub-9, using the green karma portals just takes the player to another room in the pyramid or the temple that was previously unseen. Everything is quite clearly contained in one mega spot in both games. And one last note, these two games are the only games where we hear this special sound effect. That about does it for subs 2 and 9. Let's move on, shall we? Submachine 3 The Loop versus Submachine 8 The Plan. Ah, here it is, the ultimate showdown between the ideal submachine location, the crown jewel of Sector 9, and the much despised and feared anti-location that permeates the darkest corners of the subnet. Sector 9 and The Loop are about as different from each other as you can get. One is the epitome of seven perfectly interlocking layers, while the other is an infinite black hole of puzzles that seems to pull players into sublayers and sublayers of death and demise. There's almost nothing more polarizing than the mere titles of these two games, and their architecture could not be farther apart either. Each layer of Sub-8 features a completely different and intriguing, detailed cultural setting, while the best that Sub-3 manages to do is turn each set of infinite copy-pasted rooms a slightly different color. Sub-3 also contains next to no items, save for the special green leaf at the end, while Sub-8 showcases a wide variety of intriguing trinkets and tools. Sub-3 has a straightforward playing style, with the player moving straight from level 0 to level 1 to level level 2, and so on. And Submachine 8 has the player jump back and forth between the layers of reality in the most non-linear format available. And yet, even with all of these stark contrasts, similarities are still everywhere. You can see that there are green lines that make up the projector in the Cardinal Mosque, and they look eerily similar to the green lines shown at the very end of Sub 3's outro, which outline a typical loop screen. You can hear it in the classical layer switching sound effect either via Navigator in Sub 8 or via Compass in Sub 3, which Interestingly enough, was rebranded to Navigator in the Sub-3 HD release. Also, the fact that both games rely so heavily on the player's exact spot, right down to the screen, should not go unnoticed. In Sub-3, everything relates to the origin, the center of a seemingly infinite span of rooms where we see each passage machine. Sub-8's take on location importance is quite different. Each representation of the location in Sector 9 contains the same arrangement of just 10 rooms, but like in Sub-3, the key to solving the game is learning how to work those rooms and understand their full potential. Potential. The biggest similarity of these two games is the fact that both of their settings are, to put it simply, accidental. Sub 3 is the result of using an extremely unstable karma portal that sent the player into an anti-dimension before finding an escape back to the real subnet. Sub 8 is the result of hitting a detour inside a very large and unwieldy karma portal again, and it takes the player a bit of time here as well before he or she reaches his or her planned destination, which was the not. Are these two games more similar to or different from each other taking into consideration? I'll let you decide that one. Next up is subs 4 and 7. Let's start with the most obvious similarity being the extreme amount of spatial teleportation that happens in both of these games. The teleportation concept of using lab portals is just as prevalent in sub 4 as the teleportation concept of using karma portals in Submachine 7. No other games make use of teleportation between different physical places in the subnet to the extent that these two games do. Notice, however, that the teleportation techniques used in both games have completely different results. Using a lab portal is a very refined process. None of the locations that the player visits in Sub-4 have any indication of being broken, shattered, or distorted by the portal's 
portal's usage. And of course, Sub 7's Karma portals are the most raw and dangerous forms of transportation in the entire series. They tear holes everywhere that they are placed, making the Winter Palace and South Garden descend into a pile of ruins. The portal doors are a bit more stable, but I can't imagine using those a whole lot would be good for the sub environment either. The second similarity between the two games can be found right at the beginning of these games. These two games both include relatively large starting locations, the lab and the sanctuary. They show clear signs of being occupied by Murtaugh and his teams, whether they be exploration or research teams or invasion teams. Both locations, once escaped, tend to never be visited again by the player for any practical purpose. It's almost like these two locations are their own mini-games to set up a player for the bigger game at hand. However, the locations differ still, the lab location being more vertical in structure with multiple floors, and the sanctuary being a single level horizontal line. The locations beyond the lab and the sanctuary also differ greatly between the two games, where Sub 4's various locations all exhibit different architectures while the Winter Palace and the South Garden are pretty homogenous with their shattered stones, tiled floors, and chunks of floating dirt and wood. There isn't one location that looks much different from another. The third connection that the games have is the uniqueness of the in-game notes. Both games use the notes far more extensively than most of the other games, and they are the only two sets of notes that contain personal, first-hand accounts of whomever wrote them. As a result, they offer the most lore to the series. Sub 4 chronicles the advent and fates of the exploration teams, while Sub 7 is full of records from the collapse and Murtaugh's invasion. But be careful, the notes are more opposite of each other than you would think. Notice that in Sub 4, the notes are written by members of at least four different groups of people, making it the series of notes written by the most people in the entire series. And in Sub 7, every note that we can pick up and read is written by only one person, that person being Elizabeth, making Sub 7 the game with the least diverse cast of authors for all of the notes found in the game. Finally, the last connection between the two games is their location within the subnet. Sub 4 takes place completely in the outer rim, including parts of the root, while Sub 7 takes place obviously in the core. The subnet only really has these two main areas, the outer rim or the core, and it's either one or the other, unless you want to take a visit to the loop, which probably would not be a good idea. And now, that brings us to our final pair of submachine games to look at side by side. Submachine 5 The Root, and Submachine 6 The Edge. What do both of these games have in common? An easy connection to make is the fact that both plots are driven by directions from Murtaugh. We get our instructions to retrieve wisdom gems in Submachine 5, and we take heed of the unblocked system message to disable protocols in Sub 6. It's a pretty classical formula, find a way to do this and fulfill the task. These are also the only two games in the entire series where the paper notes found cannot be picked up. The only exception to this is Sub 3 HD, where the notes serve only as secrets anyway, unless it's the final note that comes right before the game ends. But still, that's sort of interesting that these are the only two games where the paper notes cannot be picked up. And of course, though these games have their similarities, differences are bound to crop up, and they do. Consider, for example, that the root is the oldest part of the subnet, with brick walls that look like they've been around for centuries, and technology that has rusted over as time passed by. And in contrast, the edge looks pretty brand spanking new to me, with those perfect crystalline walls and fancy high-tech gadgets. And of course, I'm only referring to the defense system corridors, not the tunnels and the cliffs. Still, that's a pretty big quality difference in infrastructure. And here's another example of a contrast. The whole goal of Submachine 5 is to power up the mover to take to the edge, and the whole point of playing Sub-6 is to shut down the defense systems, supposedly. TLDR, turn one machine on, and turn another machine off. It's as simple as that. And with all of these similarities and differences out of the way of all the game pairs in the Submachine main series, there's only one element left to talk about. It's the mysterious X that I mentioned at the beginning of the video. The X is the center crease on the paper, or the mirror's edge, so to speak. It has no reflected element and stands alone as a unique event in the situation being studied. In the example of the chiastic structure of Noah and the Flood, the X moment is the moment when God acknowledges and remembers Noah and his work. And in Submachine, the X moment moment is the space between subs 5 and 6 when the mover is on its journey toward the cliffs. This is the only moment when transportation to the next game is completely physical without using any devices that rely on karmic energy, and that is what makes it so unique. Those are all the big examples I could think of that help illustrate the chiastic structure found in the submachine series. See? Studying literature can have its practical uses too! So now you can say you learned about the chiastic structure and basic physics from BTM number 1 from a video game series. Does that make you feel more intelligent or what? 
Well, probably not, but either way, it's amazing how well these games mirror each other. Once you start digging just a bit, a whole new way of experiencing Submachine is opened up before your very eyes. I hope you find yourself a little bit more enlightened. Maybe the next time you play the Submachine games, you will find similarities and differences between these game pairs that didn't even make it into this video. I'm sure they're out there somewhere. It gives you a mighty good reason to play the Submachine series again, doesn't it? That's all I've got for this video. All comments are very much appreciated. If you find something in the Submachine series that's worth mentioning or have a theory of your own, let me know in the comments. Maybe with your thoughts and guidance, we can even craft a beating the machine video out of whatever you bring to the table. Until next time, this is Jotsko signing off and hoping to see you again sometime down the road. Bye-bye.